A very good morning to all. Uh, the topic today is uh, mitochondrial hepatopathy, and uh, the way we are going to go ahead is uh, we'll discuss. The first half would be to discuss the mitochondria as as a whole, including the evolution, structure, and function, and the genome. Because without this information, it's unlikely that you will understand what exactly is mitochondrial hepatopathy. And then subsequently, the clinical features, the diagnosis, and the treatment modalities for the same. So uh, initially, uh, there are three domains that we all know: uh, the bacteria, archaea. These are the prokaryotes and the eukaryotes. <coughs> prokaryote is nothing but uh, nucleus, uh, the DNA which is single-stranded, which is uncovered by the membrane, and eukaryotes, which we belong to, all the plants and animals. We have mitochondria and the nucleus. So the important concept here to understand is endosymbiosis that was given in 1960 by a biologist, uh, Lynn Margulis, in which. Initially, uh, there were two bacteria. One bacteria goes inside the other, and they both live together in the symbiotic arrangement. So this is what happened billions of years ago when uh, aerobic bacteria entered into another cell, and these bacteria turned into mitochondria, and they they went go went ahead and formed these classical mitochondria that we all know. And in the plant cell, they are known as chloroplasts. So mitochondria are nothing but ancient bacteria. But what we have to understand that This concept that they have a bacterial or animal origin has been documented in multiple studies in which they gave oxytetracycline and doxycycline injections, and they could document that the day was decrease in cytochrome C oxidase activity. That is the complex four in the electron transport chain. You can see the compared to the controls, there is decrease decrease of this enzyme activity after giving these antibiotics. Also, giving zidovudine decreased their concentration in almost majority of these patients. also they could lead to amino glycoside auto sensitivity that is maternally transmitted so the main reason i wanted to highlight here is that mitochondria have a bacterial or kind of animal origin and therefore there are multiple drugs that we use which are known as mitochondrial toxins like cronophenicol tetracycline linozolate zidovudine even quinolones which document that this mitochondria is nothing but a parasite that has entered into your body billions of years ago And these are the mitochondrial toxins that we usually avoid so we all know uh, mitochondria you, they have a outer membrane which is increasingly uh, impermeable and then you have internal mitochondrial membrane which is goes inside in the form of cristae uh, and this harbors the entire electron transport chain different organs because of their different biochemical biosynthetic capacities have different shapes of these mitochondria as you can see in this slide and we all know i'm not going into the details uh this is glycolysis this is krebs cycle and this is electron transport chain glycolysis and krebs cycle contribute to nadh and fadh2 which goes inside the electron transport chain to generate atp what is electron transport chain is nothing but large protein complexes complex 1 to 5 and just to highlight here that uh that is nothing but that these complex 4 these are on the inner mitochondrial membrane what they actually do they do nothing they take up these hydrogen ions from nadh and fadh this is complex 1 this small one is the complex 2 sorry yeah uh what they actually do they use these hydrogen ions to create a proton gradient from the mitotic matrix to inside the intermembrane space and subsequently then this proton gradient is used by complex 5 to generate this atp which is the energy currency of the cell so such is such is the importance of this mitochondria is that they are, you have fatty acid oxidation you have urea cycle you have krebs cycle you have electron transport chain and all of the metabolic liver disorders that are known to humans subsequently affect this mitochondria so you look at all the disorders including wilson's thyroids organic acidemia gsd tyrosinemia carbohydrate defect urea cycle defect everything boils down this mitochondria so mitochondria is the last step of injury in every almost every known metabolic liver disorder a uh, few words about mitochondrial genome and geno uh, genetics mitochondrial genome is altogether different from nuclear genome it's a circular double stranded dna only codes about 13 genes 13 uh, 37 genes 13 are protein coding and 24 are related to rnas and it's non helical it lacks an intron exon structure they are very high uh, mutation rate because of limited dna repair and each cell has thousands of copies of this mitochondria so this means that other, because your nuclear genome in a cell is identical 
but in a similar cell you may have multiple mitochondria carrying all the different kind of mutations and even electrotransport chain it is encoded by both nuclear and mitochondrial genomes so this is the mitochondrial genome the double stranded structure outer one is the heavy strand inner one is the light strand and they have a 1.1 kb d loop which is the only non coding region in the mitochondrial genome which encodes uh, which helps in the transcription and translation of the proteins which are being produced by the mitochondria so what is different in mitochondrial genome is the uniqueness uh, that is what is makes it different from the nuclear genome one the most important concept here is maternal inheritance there is lack of paternal inheritance because of multiple effects that have been documented including the dilution effect the subsequent removal of sub sperm mitochondrial dna the even the bottleneck effect that i'll explain later so that is why uh, this classically the mitochondrial inheritance is maternally transmitted so you will have mothers which will transmit this disorder to their daughters and their sons the sons may get affected but they will not transmit the disorder to the next generation so this is typical for mitochondrial inheritance but some few case reports one was published in 2002 and second was published 3 years back they have documented in some of the cases that they may also be paternal transmission but it that is pretty rare the second important concept is heteroplasmy homoplasmy means that you have identical sequence of mitochondrial dna in all mitochondria of a cell but what happens is because of the bottleneck effect that i'll explain later some of the mitochondria may be carrying a smaller amount of uh, mutant dna and some of the mitochondria in the same cell may carry a higher proportion of uh, mutation so this is what happens you have a mother she may have mild or no symptoms the red one are the mutant mitochondria and the green one are the uh, the normal mitochondria so she may produce three sibling three offspring one offspring may carry majority of this red ones may go to this child and the majority of the green ones may go to the other kids so child who is carrying this it most of the this mito mutated mitochondria may go on to develop a severe disease but in the same family another offspring may have no disease at all so this is what is different from nuclear genome just in again we have to in a more simpler way you have wild type dna you have mutant dna the uh, red ones are the mutant dna you have a concept of biochemical threshold that means if you have a threshold in which the number of mitochondrial dna increases in your cell say more than 60 to 80% that is the roughly the figure which is given then only the disease will manifest in such cases so you have mitochondrial genome on one hand you have nuclear genome on the other hand so mitochondrial genome follows non mendelian inheritance and nuclear genome follows the mendelian inheritance so uh, just a quiz uh, first i have shown you two live pictures of uh, actual patient reports the first one is another exome report and a second another exome report can you tell me which one is the nuclear dna and which one is the mitochondrial dna both are mitochondrial hepatopathies so first one is mitochondrial dna you can look at the heteroplasmy more than 80% heteroplasmy that means more than 80% of the mitochondria in that tissue are carrying this mutant mutation and second one are the typical mitochondrial complex one deficiency autosomal recessive and not inheritance in which you can make out that this is the nuclear dna exome so next coming to mitochondrial hepatopathy as such uh, what is the classification and the clinical profile so we try and divide into two different categories the primary and the secondary ones primary means these are the primary disorders genetic disorders of mitochondria the most common ones as a hepatologist are this the electron transport defects in which you have neonatal liver failure kind of syndrome the complex deficiency of electron tra transport chain or the depletion syndromes the second one are the later onset liver dysfunction or failure these are the rarer syndromic syndromes which are associated with mitochondrial hepatopathy i'll explain each one of these later alpers pearsons menge syndrome navajo neurohepatopathy but the more commoner ones are faods urea cycle defects which i'm not going to discuss it here because these are not classical mitochondrial hepatopathy but they do come under this category also this one yes and the secondary ones are you can name any liver disorder including cirrhosis per se including nafeld and co2 hepatitis your run of the mill nafeld and co2 hepatitis alpha 1 wilsons everything you can name everything comes out to be in the secondary mitochondrial hepatopathy that means any disorder will ultimately lead to liver in, uh, mitochondrial injury and they are the final steps in which how a cell actually dies in uh, liver disorders uh this was a study that was published 4 uh, years back in which they documented that even in adults 
they do mostly they do have myopathic involvement but almost 5% of the cases have liver disease in children this proportion becomes higher it is roughly about one fifth of the patients who are presented with mitochondrial disorders have liver involvement as such this was one case i'll just wanted to highlight uh, presented in uh, with complaints of jaundice uh, upper abdominal distension and global developmental delay starting since early infancy uh, had hepatosplenomegaly deep ectrus had growth failure had evidence of liver dysfunction in form of Uh, jaundice with high INR, had high lactate, ammonia, high ammonia, high AFP. We could not do a liver biopsy because he had uh, ascites and coagulopathy. We did a whole exome sequencing, which came up later after the child expired. Actually, came out to be MPV 17. Uh, that is one of the mitochondrial depletion syndrome. So, just wanted to highlight that they may present in the early infancy, but you may not find any typical features that you can document that these are mitochondrial disorders. So, I'll go one by one. Uh, one of these most important manifestation for pediatric pediatric hepatologists is acute liver failure, which may present in early neonatal period or even childhood at any age. They may present just with hepatomegaly, ultrasound ultrasound showing fatty liver, cholestasis, even cirrhosis. So they may have any kind of presentation, acute, insidious, or chronic. And what happens is that they have usually a bimodal presentation. A majority of them for pediatric hepatologists they present with the first three years of life, and second peak comes in late adolescence to the fourth decade. Neonatal liver failure, uh, you have to differentiate from other common differential diagnoses. But what can be the clues for neonatal liver failure because of mitochondrial hepatopathy? The multi-system involvement, especially the neurological symptoms. Since it is a intrauterine or origin, almost one fourth of them would be low birth weight or IGR, and they may be metabolic abnormalities like lactic acidosis and everything. The genes commonly involved, uh, these are the complex deficiencies, the depletion syndrome, the TRMU, and the translational uh, tRNA defects. Mitochondrial hepatopathy is one of the most common metabolic liver disorder presenting as ALF in infants and children, as has been shown in multiple studies, including ours. The second important syndrome is Alpers Hutton Loco syndrome. It's nothing but uh, you have normal early development, and then you start developing neurological features in form of refractory seizures, and usually they do have a downhill course. And valproate is a known precipitant for acute liver failure. People unknowingly they use valproate when they are faced with refractory seizures, and this is. Ultimately leads to liver failure. That's the first precipitant. And LT is liver transplant is contraindicated if you have find a patient who has valproate induced liver failure because we assume it to be Alpers syndrome. And there are multiple diagnostic criteria have been given, and mostly it is because of the Pol G variants, gene variants. This is the most important uh, syndrome, uh, the mitochondrial depletion syndrome. Uh, that as a hepatologist, we should all know that there is abnormally low amount of mitochondrial DNA. And majority of them, they have associated CNS or muscular disorder that may not be present at the index presentation, but most of them would develop it later. Uh, the third, fourth one is the deletion syndrome. First was depletion. That means the amount of mitochondrial DNA is low, less than 10 percent, and this is deletion. That one of there is a deletion in the exome or the genome. So this is the Pearson syndrome. Uh, Pearson, we all know, is majority we associated with pancreatic insufficiency. So they start with sideroblastic anemia, anemia, pancytopenia in the early infancy. Usually they recover from that. If they do, not, if they do recover, then they start developing this uh, retinopathy of thalmoplegia. That is the Pearson Sears syndrome. May may have associated liver disorder, tubular dysfunction, pancreatitis, or pancreatic insufficiency in such cases. What is the common age for this? Uh, sir, I'll show. Uh, I'll show in the there is a graph I'll show. So when to suspect? Uh, it is difficult to identify mitochondrial disorders. They may mimic other disorders. They may have wide range of symptoms. All ages are affected from neonate to 100 years of age. They have a multi-system involvement. They may present in the same patient at different points of time. You may have liver disorder. They may present with you liver disorder, but two years, three years down the line, they may start developing myopathy or CNS disorder, and the presentation will change across the age. They will in even a single patient will keep on changing its phenotype as long as it's alive. So they may have any symptom, any organ, any time, any scenario may progress with any inheritance, nuclear or mitochondrial. But most important thing we have to understand here is that there is a discrepancy between the adult and the pediatric population uh, presentation. Pediatric population majority will present in the first two to three years of age, and the majority would have nuclear DNA defects. Adults is different. They have mostly 80% of them would have mitochondrial DNA. That means pediatric patients would mostly present with hepatic with or without myopathic involvement, but the adults would always, almost always have myopathic involvement with or without liver disorder. 
so they i'll already shown that they may present with everything so this is the slide that you can find that they can present with in any disorder so you have to remember these disorders just to remember that how we want to evaluate these cases so they may have cardiac eye renal endocrine hematological in a single in a single patient they may have all sort of manifestations so these are the red flags that i've already explained i'll not go into the details so when do you suspect mitochondrial disorder first most important multi system involvement with liver disorder rapidly progressive course without any etiology especially in the early age group unexplained lactic acidosis or recurrent symptoms unexplained fatty liver or steatosis on ultrasound or biopsy rapid deterioration with sodium valproate and last one is for fatty acid oxidation defect but rapid deterioration with minor illness and quick recovery with iv fluids that is for fatty acid oxidation vikrant is the lactic acidosis a limit beyond which you have to think that this is only minor i'll show ma'am i'll show so in hepatology practice if you find a patient unexplained liver failure in a young age unexplained fatty liver on ultrasound unexplained steatosis on liver biopsy in a child who is lean maybe or transhepatitis which is not resolving think of mitochondrial disorders so how do you approach first try and give them a syndromic diagnosis try and correlate with their phenotype do the screening biochemical test then go ahead with definitive testing and fourth the most important one is always exclude multi system involvement so try and differentiate uh, maybe i can show it like this yeah so neonatal liver failure the first component that i showed and the mitochondrial depletion syndrome they will usually present in the early infancy mostly in the liver disorder but as the age progresses they may develop this classical syndrome which are very very rare but so most of them 90 almost 90 95% of your cases as a hepatologist that you will find with either fit into this mitochondrial depletion syndrome or this neonatal liver failure group the kind of genes that i have already mentioned these four rare disorders they may so all these so any mitochondrial hepatopathy may present with as a idiopathic cirrhosis also they may present with acute liver failure also but they may present even later as cirrhosis also so we have to concentrate most on this group the present who presents with neonatal liver failure and mitochondrial depletion syndrome so i try to tabulate it so most important thing is then elpers and pearsons they may have normal lactate but otherwise predominantly you look at the most common disorders they have high lactic acidosis with high uh, lactate pyruvate ratio and genes i have already mentioned here but elpers and pearsons may or may not have high lactate or high lactate pyruvate ratio so these are the screening tests that we use uh, use lactate Uh, use lactate pyruvate ratio this uh, the red ones i have highlighted they are not actually available in india nobody is doing it the blood ketone bodies and even csf lactate is not easily available so what we are dependent on using screening tests are lactate and lactate pyruvate ratio even pyruvate is not being done in majority of the institutes not even in ours because it's a volatile component you have to send it to a lab the you have to send the patient to the lab because they have to process it within one hour so it's not easy to get it done so the most important thing is you try and differentiate your mitochondrial disorder the respiratory chain defects from the more common disorders like fatty acid oxidation defects urea cycle defects based on the your first line screening test so fatty acid it would have non ketotic hypoglycemia respiratory chain defects the mitochondrial defects would predominantly have a very high lactate organic acidemia will predominantly have acidosis with ketones urea cycle defects are mostly all have normal these parameters but very high ammonia so one important concept i want to highlight is lactic acidemia there is a difference between lactic acidosis and hyperlactatemia in mitochondrial hepatopathy is predominantly lactic acidosis with a concomitant decrease in the bicarb but if you find a patient who has high lactate even with a bicarb which is which is normal they you may not be dealing with mitochondrial disorders mostly the cut off they give is 2.5 or more than that but ideally in most of the cases is usually the lactate is usually beyond more than 6 in classical mitochondrial hepatopathies so you have to know that the most common disorder is not metabolic of high lactate majority almost 99 out of 100 cases it is not metabolic liver disorder is other risk factors like anoxia ischemia so this is the hyperlactatemia diagnostic approach i'll not go into the details but mostly you have to realize with respect to the hypoglycemia whether it is pre uh, on fasting post prandial or with neural permanent hypoglycemia then you have to differentiate based on these multiple metabolic liver disorder so i'll not go into the details uh like i can skip that yes so the biomarkers that we use are lactate pyruvate alanine and csf lactate but studies have shown that this was a study that was published from children's group in which they uh, calculated this lactate pyruvate ratio or high lactate in all the pels uh, group 
all group, mitochondrial group, indeterminate ALF and other group, they found that there was no difference in the lactate pyruvate ratio. So what they documented is a high lactate or even a elevated lactate pyruvate ratio was common in all causes of PELF and not limited to those with a mitochondrial etiology. So it's not very specific. Other biomarkers have been used, the FGF21 and growth differentiation factor 15. Overall, they have poor specificity but high sensitivity. So they are not for diagnosis per se. These are the definitive tests that we use. First one is the mitochondrial respiration uh, uh, measurement using polarographic studies. You can do a direct enzyme estimation of that complex 1 to 5 or you can do the mutation testing or you can do the histopathology. So this is the uh, polyacrylamide uh, gel electrophoresis. You can see compared to con uh, controls, the complex 1 is deficient, complex 5 is deficient, complex, uh, complex 4, complex 5 is deficient and 2 is normal. Liver biopsy will only show you the standard uh, biopsy will only show you steatosis, but if you do electron microscopy, you will find significant steatosis and this abnormal pleomorphic mitochondria. Also, you will find this increased concentration of this mitochondria, the black ones that you can see here. Muscle biopsy is required. You can see the red, red fibers uh, because of sub uh, uh, sarcolabular mitochondrial accumulation. You may find cytoch uh, cytochrome oxidase or uh, this STH deficiency, uh, these are the fibers which are depleted for this cytochrome oxidase activity and all you may find these uh, parking lot like inclusions because of increased accumulation of these mitochondria which are uh, in the subsarcolemal area. This is the uh, uh, device which is available at in ILBS. Uh, this is, I'll show the picture later. If you can differentiate both the glycolysis using the extracellular acidification rate and oxygen consumption rate for mitochondrial respiration. This is the seahorse analyzer that is being available at ILBS. The genetic testing we all know with this the nuclear DNA and the mitochondrial DNA. In pediatric population, we focus on nuclear DNA that is the standard clinical exome or a whole exome sequencing that you can do. If it is negative, then you can go with mitochondrial DNA. But in adults, if you have a presentation with myopathy with or without liver disease, the first line investigation should be mitochondrial DNA rather than the standard clinical exome or whole exome. So this is uh, so this is the analyzer that is available. It simultaneously measures both the mitochondrial respiration and the glycolysis using these two parameters: the extracellular acidification rate and oxygen consumption rate. Yes, ma'am. This is the two parameters that we use. You can grossly differentiate what is the mitochondrial respiration has been happening in all the tissues. I'm not I am not well versed with this. Dr. Anupam gave it gave these slides to me. I'm not sure whether they can actually pinpoint which complex is deficient. Maybe Dr. Anupam would be able to clarify it further, but I'm not aware. Maybe you because on the substrate use. Okay. So in 2013, when they gave this diagnostic approach given by the children group in the United States, they started with the screening test, went ahead with the tier 2 test, including the genotype for the more common genes, and the third tier was tissue evaluation, the functional evaluation, including liver biopsy and my, uh, muscle tissue. But some things have changed over the last decade, and when they gave in 2013, they gave that next generation sequencing will allow in the future because of the lower cost, but in 2020s, after a decade, the things have changed. If you have suspicion for mitochondrial hepatopathy, you do your screening test and simultaneously you send for your exome genetic testing. If it is negative, then only go ahead with your tissue-based evaluation or the functional evaluation in such cases. But the most important test, anyone? Is your clinical observation and awareness. You have to realize that you have to suspect first, get the entire multi-system involvement or evaluation done before going ahead with functional evaluation or genetic testing. And this is the most important slide of my entire presentation. Always look for multi-system involvement. They have highlighted the kind of tests that you have to do in every patient. Don't think that he is not presented with neurological involvement, so I won't do MRI brain. He is not presented with a muscular involvement, I will not do a CPK. Do it in a every patient of mitochondrial, suspected mitochondrial disorder. There are no definitive treatment for any mitochondrial disorder except maybe cysteine supplementation which may even prevent or re reverse your liver failure because of TRMU. TRMU is one of the neonatal liver failure genes. Uh, systemic therapy is mostly supportive. You avoid the mitochondrial toxin. If you have uh, seizures, avoid valproate, avoid catabolism, 
Exercise has been shown that it may improve some of the mitochondrial disorders and gene therapy as per other disorders also. Drugs, I have already shown this slide. Uh, you have to avoid all these drugs, including propofol, your uh, ringer selected that we usually avoid, avoid valproate, avoid phenobarbiton, avoid these antibiotics that are given here, including salicylic acid and acetaminophen or paracetamol that we also use. This is the mitochondrial cocktail. Nobody knows whether it works or not, even in neurological, myopathic, or liver involvement, but we all give it because uh, they are available over the counter. That's the only thing you can, you can provide these patients with. So do you have electron transport uh, effectors? The most important one is the coenzyme Q. You can give all this vitamin B1, B2, K3, vitamin E, ascorbic acid, all this carnitine, if there is secondary carnitine deficiency, that you can give in every. So this is being followed by every specialty, Neurolog ne uh, neurologists, cardiologists, uh, geneticists, hepatologists, everyone is following this entire same cocktail. Transplantation is other concept, uh, concept altogether. You have this, I didn't go through uh, this uh, gastrointestinal and myopathy, but you have bone marrow transplantation in such cases. Liver transplantation is usually contraindicated if extra hepatic symptoms are present, especially if you have valproate induced acute liver failure, where we presume it is because of palsy mutation and you do not go ahead with transplantation. But what about ALF? If you have a case, if you suspect mitochondrial hepatopathy based on your personal or family history, your examination, you may have hypertonic, uh, some neurological involvement, you do your screening test, you find lactic acidosis, what do you do in such cases? Do you refuse liver transplantation? It's difficult to answer, but some studies have been done in which they also face the same thing. They had patients early infancy mostly, uh, early infancy or early childhood. They, they faced with patients who presented with acute liver failure. So they were in a quandary that whether you should transplant these patients or not. Most of them were diagnosed the, uh, on genetic testing, which came after they had transplanted. So the, the important thing here to note is that uh, majority had good survival. So this is acute liver failure, not as good as survival. As you can see in other patients, only 60% survival at two years. That is pretty low as compared to other indications of liver transplantation. But if you face a patient who is acute liver failure, and you do not find any extra hepatic symptoms or on evaluation. It's not just symptoms. They may not have history of developmental delay or myopathy or axial hypotonia or peripheral neuropathy, but on evaluation, you have to do the entire evaluation. If you do not find, you can go ahead with liver transplantation. And even if you get a genetic report later, which will come after two to three weeks or four weeks after you're transplanted, you may not, uh, you can always prognosticate them that some of them would develop prog uh, progression of neurological or muscular disorder later in life, but some may actually have complete resolution even after this. You can suspect, you can always prognosticate them, but you cannot def differentiate because of other disorders. Yes. So prevention is always better than cure. If you have a positive family history, you have to prevent the further transmission. So uh, what do you do in such cases? If there are nuclear DNA defects, you can just do a standard genetic diagnosis. You can do a uh, CVS sampling, amniocentesis, do the mutation testing even in the prenatal period, or oh, sorry, during the conception. But if it is mitochondrial DNA, it is very complicated. So you will not understand because a mother may be having a severe disorder because of that bottleneck effect I told you. You cannot predict whether the child is going to have mitochondrial disorder or not. It may have a severe disorder just like the mother, or you may have no disorder like uh, because all the maybe the child would receive all the normal mitochondria. So it is very complicated. You cannot give any genetic advice. What you can do in such cases is this is a concept which has come up in last five years or so mitochondrial donation. I'll not go into the details. What they do is they can use a donor oocyte from an unaffected patient. Either you can do it before fertilization or after fertilization. Before, before fertilization, you remove the spindle. Trans, uh, transfer it to the other, the defective oocyte, and you can give a normal zygote, and you can do it before fertilization, uh, after fertilization also, you can remove the pro-nucleus from the unaffected woman and give it to the, uh, the affected mother. So this has been done, only case reports are available, but it is being done. Uh, thank you, and I'll be happy to take any questions.